Well, when the Challenger space shuttle exploded in 1986, killing seven people, the nation was in a state of shock. It had been a long time since the space program had lost any lives. But the situation in 1986 was even worse. The shuttle had been carrying an American school teacher named Krista McAuliffe. So millions of American school children were watching the launch live and saw the explosion on live television, on their TVs, in school. To ease the nation's pain, President Ronald Reagan delivered a speech that evening from the Oval Office, a speech written by speechwriter Peggy Noonan. Now, Reagan was actually supposed to deliver the state of the roof that night, but he delayed it <laughs> so that he could comfort the nation and uh, her school children in their grief. In his short speech, though, he listed the names of the deceased. He spoke to their families, promising them that their sacrifice was not in vain. He explained to everyone that the astronauts knew the risks they were taking. He promised America that this setback would not slow America down. He honored the fallen and promised that we would not forget them, nor the last time we saw them that morning as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of Earth to touch the face of God. Now, I watched Reagan's speech again this week, and I was nearly brought to tears by his grandfatherly reassurances, uh, by his compassion and by his grace. And I was reminded that this is one of the things we want in our leaders. We want leaders with compassion. We want leaders who care about us. And that's what we're talking about in our current series. We're talking about what we want in leaders. But Jesus excels in all of them. Jesus is more than qualified to be the next president of the United States. The only thing is, Jesus does not want to be the next president of the United States. Jesus wants to be the president of our hearts, a much more important position. Jesus is running for the presidency of our souls. Jesus wants to lead us and our churches all the way to heaven. So during this series then, we've been looking at the attributes we look for in presidential candidates and showing how Jesus has those attributes necessary to lead us. So over the past few weeks, we've looked at several attributes that we look for in candidates, like integrity and character and outsider status and, and leadership. And this morning, I want to look at another characteristic we look for in presidential candidates. We look for compassion. Now, compassion is a feeling of deep sympathy for someone who is suffering and a desire to somehow alleviate that suffering. The word compassion, the etymology of the word compassion, etymology is sort of the breakdown of the word, and the etymology of the word compassion means to literally suffer with. So passion means suffering. It's why we refer to the sufferings of the Christ on Good Friday as the passion of the Christ, because passion means suffering. And the prefix com means with. So to have compassion on someone is literally to suffer with them. Compassion is one of those things where we expect everybody to have in at least some measure. I mean, if you were alive and breathing, we expect you to care at least a little bit for at least someone in your life. But when it comes to presidents, we really expect them to be people of compassion. I mean, if you're going to lead our nation, you should be a person who cares for others. Now, I say that, but interestingly... It was not prior to President Reagan, it was actually not overly important that presidents be people who cared. The electorate knew that they were not electing a chief counselor. They were electing a chief executive. They didn't necessarily need to be people of compassion in order to lead us into war and blow up the enemy. It's why, in, in fact, some people even thought compassion, presidential com compassion, was a bit of an impediment to leadership. It's why FDR... Franklin Delano Roosevelt so famously hid his disability because he did not want to be seen as soft. But, according to presidential historians, after Reagan, everything changed. With his telegenic, avuncular demeanor, people felt like Reagan really cared, and they liked it. Suddenly, the president had to be the nation's consoler-in-chief, and every president since has made sure to demonstrate compassion at the slightest opportunity, like President Jed Bartlett showing up at a tornado scene to help out. I know President Bartlett was not actually the President of the United States, but I do certainly wish that he could have been. President Clinton, for example, was sure to be on site after the Oklahoma City bombing. He told Americans he felt our pain. 
President Bush's finest moment was atop the rubble in New York after 9-11 when he promised the rescue workers that he heard their anger and he heard their agony. President Obama sat with parents after the Sandy Hook shooting, was on scene after Hurricane Sandy. We want our presidents to care. Even though they can't really do anything, and even if their presence on, uh, in disaster sites like, complicates relief efforts, we still want to see them caring, and we crucify them if we're not convinced they care enough. When, the administra when President Bush's administration was slow to respond to Hurricane Katrina, his approval numbers dipped by double digits, and they never really recovered. When President Obama uh, did not cancel his vacation to go attend to the flooding in Louisiana, where he could do very little, by the way, the conservative press hounded him. We want to know our leaders care. Oftentimes, it can make the difference between an election, in fact. In 2012, when Mitt Romney was running against President Obama a few years ago, Romney actually beat Obama in most exit polls. When asked which candidate shares their values, is a strong leader, and has a vision for the future, Romney beat Obama handily. But when pollsters asked voters which candidate cares about people like me, this wealthy investment banker lost in a landslide by 68 points, uh, 63 points, 81 to 18. That metric alone seems to have turned the election. People just did not think that Romney cared about them. The issue of compassion is also having an impact on this election. Donald Trump is behind Hillary Clinton in most polls for many reasons, but one of the reasons is that people are not convinced he cares. According to one poll, when asked the question, which candidate cares about people like me, 45% said Hillary Clinton, 29% said Donald Trump. Now, some people are okay with that. Like I said, not everybody is convinced that leaders need to be compassionate. A lot of people like Donald Trump not because he cares, but precisely because he does not, at least about things like political correctness and other things like that. But many people are convinced of the opposite. We want leaders who care. Why? Because leadership should be about improving the lives of your followers, and we justifiably presume that you have to care about people in order to want to improve their lives. Leaders who care tend to be better leaders, who get better results from followers. Has anybody here ever worked for a boss who just did not seem to care a whit about them? It was, or any of my church staff raising their hands, by the way. <laughs> I'm sure it was a miserable experience for you. I mean, leaders who have compassion are better leaders. Uh, they inspire their people more effectively. They create happier, healthier, more productive work environments. We want leaders who care about people. Of course, this is why so many of us in this room follow Jesus Christ. We follow Jesus because he is the Son of God and because he has shown us time and time again, more than any other leader on the planet, that he cares about us. He cares about who we are cares about where we've been, cares about where we're going, cares about what we're feeling, cares about what we've done, cares about what we're thinking. We worship a Savior who cares. In fact, when God the Father, Yahweh of the Old Testament, introduced himself to Moses, he introduced himself as a God of compassion. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Yahweh, to the Israelites, was a God by definition of compassion. And then when Jesus appeared as the son of the father, he came as the living embodiment of the father's compassion. We follow a savior who cares. We see this all over scripture too, that Jesus by definition is a God who cares. In the Bible, we see just how much Jesus cares too. Jesus doesn't just care a little bit. Jesus cares a lot, and there's a difference. In fact, this week I read an article about compassion and what defines what compassion really is. And the author definition of compassion in his mind. He said, compassion, genuine compassion, real compassion, has three elements. Genuine compassion consists of three elements. It consists of, first, understanding. Uh, I understand your need. I understand exactly what your situation is right now. But it goes beyond that. Genuine compassion consists also of empathy. Not just I understand you, but I feel for you. I feel with you. And thirdly, genuine compassion includes helpfulness. I can do something for you and I will do something for you. That's what genuine compassion consists of, understanding, empathy, 
and helpfulness. By those measurements, Jesus was an incredibly compassionate leader. I could share with you all kinds of examples of Jesus' compassion, but let me share with you one from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15. You might have heard about this story. It's the story of the feeding of the 4,000. Anybody ever heard of this story? So Jesus is out in the countryside doing his teaching, preaching, miracle-working thing, and a whole bunch of people have slowly filtered out in the countryside to watch him do his thing. They were just amazed. Every word he said, everything he did, they were just over the moon for him. In fact, they were so fascinated by Jesus and his power and his grace and his compassion that they actually forgot to eat, and they forgot to go home. And after three days, they realized this, that they were very hungry. And that as much as they loved watching this guy do his thing, they needed to go home to eat. But it was too late in the day, and they were all going to collapse from hunger because they were that exhausted. I'm sure that, you know, when I speak and eventually you just kind of forget yourself and that you forget how hungry you are, and you know what this is like, right? What they were feeling, I'm, I'm sure. Right. So this is a problem. This is a situation. And as Matthew records the moment, Jesus called his disciples to him, and he said, I have compassion on these people. They've already been with me three days, have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry, or they may collapse on the way. So what did he do? He found seven little loaves of bread, a few little fish, did his miracle-working thing, multiplied the food stuffs, and solved the problem. As Matthew records, Jesus told the crowd to sit down on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves and the fish, and when he had given thanks, he broke them, gave them to his disciples, they in turn to the people, They all ate and were satisfied. This is a wonderful example, demonstration of the multi-leveled compassion of Jesus. I mean, first he understood the people's problem. He understood what the situation was there. They were hungry. They have nothing to eat. I understand you. If you sent them home, they'd collapse on the way. Second, he empathized with them. He felt for them. Jesus said, I have compassion on these people. The Greek word for compassion, this might be interesting for you, the Greek word for compassion is a fun Greek word to say. The Greek word is splagidzomai. Fun. Splagidzomai. Would you like to say it with me? Splagidzomai. You got to say it, you know. Splagidzomai. Like a German officer. Splagidzomai. Oh, you losers. (laughs) Sorry, that was not very compassionate. (laughs) Splagidzomai. Anyway, the word splegizomai, it means to have pity on. But a much more literal rendering of the word means to feel sorry for someone in the bowels. Feel sorry for someone in the bowels down there. The ancients registered their feelings in their body. So the heart was the source of life. The hands was where your strength resided. And when you felt sympathy and compassion for other people, you felt it in the bowels. That's where it came from down there. That's where you felt sympathy for people. So if your stomach was grumbling, it's not necessarily because you were hungry. You feel sorry for someone somewhere. Jesus didn't just understand their need. He felt for them. He empathized with them in the bowels. But not just that. Lastly, he was also helpful. He found some bread and some fish so they could go home without collapsing. As Matthew writes, they all ate and were satisfied. They went home happy. This is what real compassion is. It's understanding someone's need, empathizing with them in the bowels, and doing something about it. And this is where so many of our politicians fall short. A lot of them don't even understand what normal people like you and I go through. They don't understand the hardships that normal people have to experience on a day-to-day basis. Or if they do understand, they don't necessarily, uh, necessarily empathize. They don't really get it. They've never really been poor. They've never really been discriminated against. They've really, never really known homelessness. But maybe if they do empathize, they don't do anything about it. They just assume that somebody else should do something about it. You know, that person should go get a job, or some other organization should help them. <clears throat> Even the most compassionate leaders fall short of the perfect compassion of Christ. If they, don't understand, if they understand, they don't empathize. If they don't empathize, uh, they don't serve. But it's not just our leaders who lack compassion. We do, too. We get on our high horse during election season. We say we want a president who cares about people like me. But if we're honest with ourselves, we don't even care about people like us. I was on Facebook the other day. Maybe you saw this story on Facebook and saw this story come out of New Delhi, India. A pedestrian was accidentally hit by a truck passing by in the morning traffic. The pedestrian was violently thrown to the gutter. 
The driver stopped to his credit, got out, saw the man lying there, bleeding but alive. Then he got back in his truck and drove off. The man laid there, barely alive, with nobody to help him. People walked around him. People stepped over him. A man on a motorbike stopped, looked at his belongings, picked them up, pocketed them, and drove off. Ninety minutes later, someone finally stopped to help. But it was too late. The man, who was working two jobs to support his family, was dead by the time he got to the hospital. Now, I know you think that we're better than this. We're not. These are members of our species. And we can be just as compassionless. Uh, I drove by a beggar on the street corner the other day. It didn't even occur to me that I drove by a beggar on the street corner the other day. Hours later, I didn't even notice him. I didn't reach for my wallet. I didn't search for change in the bottom of the car. I didn't even roll down the window. I didn't even look at him. I don't think I even ignored him. That would have required energy on my part. I didn't even ignore him. I just didn't even notice him. I, for all intents and purposes, stepped over him. He just kind of blended into the background. Now, I know you can't help everyone, and you know who knows if giving money to beggars is even a good idea, but when did it become okay for followers of Jesus Christ to not even notice poor people who are directly asking me for help? When did that become okay? We all struggle with compassion. But this is why Jesus came. He came to show us the compassion of the Father and have compassion on us. Because we're all like that man in New Delhi, lying in a ditch by the road. We've all been run over by life and sin. We have no hope of eternal life. We have no hope of seeing God. We're just lying there in our guilt and sin sickness and our brokenness while people walk around us, steal our things. We've all been run over by life. But Jesus stopped and he picked us up. He saw what we needed, he felt our pain, and then he did something about it. What am I talking about? He died for our sins. He saw us in our sin, our crimes against God. He didn't want us to suffer the wrath of separation from God in hell. So he gave up his life on the cross so we could be forgiven. Remember, that's what genuine compassion is. Compassion is understanding, empathy, helpfulness. Jesus understood our situation before God. He knew that we were helpless in our sin. And he felt for us. He empathized. He didn't want us to suffer eternity apart from God. So he did something about it. He died for our sins on the cross so that we could be forgiven. And he rose from the dead so that we could live forever with him. That's genuine compassion. Jesus is a man of genuine compassion. Now, what does that mean for us? Well, it means a couple things. What does it mean that Jesus is a man of genuine compassion? It means a couple things. First, it means that we should follow Jesus. If we really want a leader of compassion, then we shouldn't settle for leaders who don't really care for others. I mean, at the most... Our leaders care for other people about, with the same sort of compassion that we care for other people, which isn't that much. We shouldn't settle for leaders like that. We should follow one who genuinely cares for people, one like Jesus. When we experience the compassion of Jesus, that should be what we're led to do. We're, we should be led to follow him. The Gospel of Matthew, for example, Jesus is leaving the town of Jericho, and he hears two blind men calling out for help. They cry out, Son of David, have mercy on us. Son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stops. He goes over to them. Matthew writes, he had compassion on them, splegizomai, and he touched their eyes. Immediately, they received their sight and followed him. I love that last little detail. Immediately, they received their sight, and what did they do? They followed him. I mean, how could they not? That man had just given them their sight back. What else were they to do? Of course they would follow him. I mean, who else had ever done anything like that for them before in their life? Of course they're going to follow him. That's what you do when you encounter the compassion of Christ. You follow him. It's like one of my early Christian mentors in the faith, a pastor that I knew in college named Joe. Now, Joe wasn't a super pastor or anything. He wasn't like a fantastic preacher or a super-duper leader. In fact, he was a absolutely terrible administrator. But I'm telling you, that boy cared for you. 
He cared for me more than anybody next to my mom and dad cared for me in life. He would listen to you and encourage you and make you laugh and pray for you and give you hugs. And if there was anything he could possibly do for you, he would do it. I followed him as my spiritual leader for over six years simply because he cared for me. You've heard it said, people don't care how much you know unless they know how much you care. Anybody heard that? People don't care how much you know unless they know how much you care. Jesus, Joe, my friend, Joe, like personified that. He practically invented the phrase. And I followed him for it. I would have run over a cliff for him. Jesus personifies it more, though. So don't waste too much time following leaders you know don't really care that much about you. Trump and Hillary and Stein and Johnson might say they care about people like you, but be deeply skeptical. If you're going to follow any leader into battle this election season, follow Jesus. He is the only leader who really, genuinely, truly cares for you. He's the only leader who gave up his life on a cross so that you could live forever and is waiting for you at the end of your life to show you the eternity of glory that he has in store for you. That's what it means to follow Jesus as a man of compassion. It means we should follow him. But secondly, it means something else. It means we should learn compassion. It's not enough to be cared for by Jesus. We have to care for others the way Jesus cares for us. As Paul writes to the Ephesians, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Be kind and compassionate to one another, he says. We must learn compassion. Compassion can be hard given our myopic selfishness, but it can be learned. I told you earlier about me completely ignoring or not even ignoring, like I said, not even noticing a beggar by the street. Let me tell you about a friend of mine who eventually did much better than me and is learning compassion maybe at a better clip than I am. Steve Schrage, he's one of our leaders around here, is actually a candidate for eldership this fall, and he told me a story about a similar situation a while back. Steve was at the new building a couple months ago uh, doing some work one Saturday morning with some volunteers. After he finished the building, he had some donuts that he brought for the volunteers, after he finished for the build, uh, at the building, he uh, drove home with the half-eaten donuts. And he drove past a corner where there was a family sitting on the corner, two parents and three young children. He was struck by the sight. And uh, the sight struck him, and he found himself wrestling with a variety of thoughts. He found himself judging these parents for possibly using their children in the summer heat to manipulate people to give money, but also earnestly wondering, as a Christian, if he could do anything for them. Ultimately, he decided to give them his leftover donuts, rolled down his window, gave him the donuts, drove off. As he was driving off, he thought, well, that was dumb. There's, for all I know, a homeless family sitting there in the heat on the corner, and I gave them my donuts. Surely, as a follower of Jesus Christ, God expected me to, be, to do a little bit more than that. Now, most people, you and I included probably, would drive on and forget it, Right? Not Steve Schrag, if you know him. Went home, talked to his wife, Aaron, described the situation, tried to figure out what they could do. Aaron asked Steve if maybe, maybe uh, Steve wanted to go back and invite this family to live with them in their house. Now, Aaron and Steve have like 17 kids, so it's not like they have a lot of space <laughs> for them. They batted that idea around. Well, could we fit them here? How would that work? Do we know them? Ultimately, they decided that might be a little too much too soon, but we got to do something. So they got a few boxes together, put some clothes and some diapers and some food in the boxes. Steve packed them all in the truck. He drove back to the corner, found the family through very broken English, discovered they were Romanian. They were very grateful for the gifts. He gave them the gifts, drove off. But even then, he wasn't really super satisfied. I mean, realistically, he's not going to miss any of those items. I mean, he grew out of diapers a long time ago. He's not going to miss those. He's not going to miss mac and cheese. I mean, they're going to go to the store and get more mac and cheese. He's not really that satisfied with what he did then either. And ever since then, he's been wondering, what could I have done? Could I have done more? What am I going to do the next time I see somebody in need? That's the Holy Spirit teaching him compassion. That's the Holy Spirit prodding him to think of all the many ways he can show the world the compassion that God has shown him in Jesus Christ. It reminds me of something that the former president, Jimmy Carter, once said. You know Jimmy Carter? Go, Jimmy. 
Uh, Jimmy is a follower of Jesus, who's actually had more success as an ex-president than as an actual president. Uh, after he was kicked out of office, his political career was over. I mean, for all intents and purposes, he was a one-term failed Democratic president. He knew that his political life was, was over. But he also know, knew that his calling as a follower of Jesus was definitely not. So Jimmy started the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter Work Project. Together with Habitat for Humanity, they would renovate houses, build homes for families. Since 1986, in the 30 years since they started the project, the Carters have mobilized 89,000 volunteers to serve 3,800 families with housing in 14 countries. He understood the need. These people don't have homes. He felt for them. That would be terrible, not having a home. And he knew he could do something about it. Let's give them a home. As Carter said, my faith demands, and this is not optional, my faith demands that I do whatever I can, whenever I can, wherever I can, for as long as I can, with whatever I have, to make a difference. That's what it means that Jesus is a man of compassion. It means we have to show it somehow, however we can, to world in need. We have to show it however we can. And we can do that in lots of ways. We can give donuts and diapers to poor families. We can forgive our neighbors. We can serve our coworkers. We can work at the food pantry or volunteer at the nursing home or head down to Mexico with the crew over Christmas. God, Jimmy Carter, they're not specific. He just wants us to do whatever we can, wherever we can, whenever we can, for as long as we can, with whatever we have. So do you know the compassion of Jesus Christ? Have you felt his mercy and grace in your life? Have you experienced him picking you up out of that gutter, forgiving you of your sins, setting you on your feet, pouring his Holy Spirit into your life, giving you strength to live the rest of it all the way into eternity? Have you known and experienced the compassion of Jesus Christ? And how are you going to show it to the world? How are you going to show it to the poor on the street corners? How are you going to show it to your neighbors and your friends? In Jesus Christ, God showed his compassion to you. How are you and I going to show it to everybody? Let's pray.